Today, with the help of God, I'd like to meditate with you on the gospel reading. Uh, and the title of our talk today is I Witness. I Witness. And it's based on what Thomas said uh, to the disciples when they said to him, uh, we have seen the Lord and he lives. And Thomas said, unless I see with my own eyes his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And, uh, and the Lord's response after he showed Thomas uh, the nail prints and the wound in his side and showed him himself alive, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me with your own eyes, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen with their own eyes and yet have believed. How many, next slide, Nina, please, yeah. How many eyewitnesses are sufficient in a court of law? In the United States, one. He will stand before the jury, and if he convinces them he's telling the truth, one is enough. The Bible says minimum two, preferably three, but at least two and that's in Deuteronomy 19.15. Okay. How many witnessed the crucifixion and death of Jesus on the cross? If you look at this sketch, uh, you will see uh, Jesus was arrested in station number one. That's Gethsemane. He was taken to the palace of the high, high priest. That's number two. Then he uh, appeared before Pilate, that's number three. Then he went and appeared before Herod, who was visiting uh, Jerusalem at the time, number four. Then he sent him back to Pilate, that's number five. And eventually they took him out of the walls of the city. And the walls of the city in this sketch are these uh, interrupted line. And you can see the cross, and I circled it with the red, uh, just outside the wall. So they took him out of one of the gates and uh, they put him on the cross on a hill uh, outside the wall so he can be seen by everybody. And uh, in those days, the downtown, the city, uh, was the place where everybody uh, lived and went home at the end of the day. So it's the opposite of what we are doing nowadays. Nowadays, we, we live in the suburb and go work in downtown and then come back to the suburb to spend our evenings. Uh, actually, it was the complete opposite in, in those days. People went out to the fields, whether they are farming, they are working in their vineyards or taking their sheep for pasture. And in the evening, they all came into downtown, into the city, uh, inside the walls uh, for, uh, for safety and they spend their night in downtown. So Jesus was put in the cross in the morning. He was taken off the cross dead at the end of the day. So pretty much everyone who was going out of the city that morning saw him hanging on the cross. And everyone uh, coming back from their business, <coughs> going home to spend the evening in the city, saw him on the cross that evening. And it's estimated that the population of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus was about 25,000. But that was a special time when Jesus was crucified. It was a Passover, so there were a lot of people visiting from all over. So it's estimated that probably four to five times this many people were in the city at the time of crucifixion. So the answer to how many people witnessed and seen with their own eyes Jesus on the cross, it's a few tens of thousands of people. How many people witnessed 
the risen Christ, saw him with their own eyes. They are eyewitnesses of Jesus alive after they saw him on the cross, and many of them saw him die on the cross and taken down uh, off the cross. We know on, on day one of, uh, of the resurrection, the first one to see him and talk to him was Mary Magdalene. And then that very evening of that uh, Sunday, the 10 disciples, Thomas was not there. And then on the second day, there were the two disciples of Emmaus, you're familiar with the story. And then day eight is when uh, Jesus appeared to the 11 disciples, now Thomas, who was absent on day two, now will see the risen Lord. By day 40, when Jesus uh, ascended to heaven, that's around 33 AD, there were 500 plus eyewitnesses, people who had seen Jesus die and then saw him alive again. Um, and Paul wrote for us in 1 Corinthians, that's around 50 AD, okay, so Jesus, we, we calculate the years that uh, whether it's perfectly accurate or not but Jesus was born around 1 AD he died around 33 AD around 50 AD Paul writes uh, to the Corinthians the first epistle the first letter and he says I deliver to you first of all that I what I have received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he, was, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, by the 12, then was seen by over 500 brethren at once when they all uh, came to say uh, goodbye to him and farewell when he was uh, going back to heaven of whom the greater part remains to be present. So we're talking about 50 AD, and he's saying most of those 500 plus eyewitnesses who had seen with their own eyes Jesus die on the cross and then alive again, they are still alive. And if you doubt me, go ask them. Of whom the greater part remains to be present. But some have fallen asleep. You have passed away, but most of those 500 plus are still around. Go ask them if you don't believe me. And after he was seen by James, James is, uh, is one of the, uh, the disciples. He's a brother of the Lord, so he's not one of the 12, and he was skeptic, and uh, he did not believe that Jesus was God until after the resurrection. And by all the apostles, and last of them all, I saw him myself, okay? So he's saying I was like somebody born out of due time. So he was saying, I have seen him with my own eyes, last of all. So I'm writing for you to this. There are 500 plus eyewitnesses. Most of them are still around. If you have any doubts about the resurrection of Jesus, go ask them, 500 plus. And that's what we call the first generation of eyewitnesses, okay? Remember when I said in the beginning, how many eyewitnesses are enough in a court of law now in the United States? One, he has 500 some. And if we're gonna follow the strict definition of eyewitnesses by the Bible, we need two, minimum, three. We have here 500 plus. And if we bring to these, if we were to bring in our present time these 500 plus witnesses in a court of law here in the United States and examine every one of them just for 15 minutes, they stand uh, before the jury and the audience and raise their hand and I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and who are you? And they will introduce themselves and just for a brief 15 minutes each to say, what did you see? And they will say, I saw him die, I saw him alive after. That would take about 7,500 minutes. That's about 125 hours. 
that's 15 work days, if we count the work day as eight hours, from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. with a little break for lunch and rest and use the restroom and such, that's three working days in our time. Just to listen to everyone briefly saying, this is my name, I was in Jerusalem that day, I saw him die on the cross and I saw him alive after. And the 500 plus will say the same thing. There is no discrepancy. So how many eyewitnesses do you think are enough to convince the Jews? How many eyewitnesses are enough to convince you? And how many witnesses are enough to convince those who deny the death and resurrection of Christ? is something called conclusion bias. Conclusion bias, when someone makes a decision before examining the facts, he made up his mind, and nothing is going to change him, is going to make him change his mind. He's made the decision. This is what I'm going to believe, and I refuse to believe anything else. And they make their decision before they examine the facts and listen to the witnesses. And those are the ones who deny the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And they do this because they do not want to believe. It's not like it's not believable. They just don't want to believe. It's not because of there is lack of evidence. And why do they refuse to believe? They refuse to believe because if they were put to believe in the death and resurrection of Christ, they have to believe in him and take him as Lord and God and Savior and change their way of life and follow his commandments. And they do not want to do that. They want to keep doing what they are doing, enjoy what they are doing, and they do not want to change. So the way out of it is to deny that Jesus either existed or died on the cross or rose again from the dead. As I said earlier, thousands, tens of thousands of people passing through the gate in the wall of Jerusalem that day saw him on the cross, on the hill. 500 at least saw him alive 40 days after his resurrection. And even some skeptics, I give you example, James, the brother of the Lord, he did not believe until after the resurrection, then he became uh, the first bishop of Jerusalem and was martyred for what he uh, confessed later on. And of course, you're all familiar with Saul, who did not believe, persecuted the Christians until he saw Jesus with his own eyes and changed his ways and became Paul and gave up his life, eventually died to witness to the death and resurrection of Christ. And uh, we still have an empty tomb in Jerusalem and out of that tomb comes a miracle of light every Saturday to this very day, almost 21, th uh, 21 centuries later. Next slide, please. So what about that first generation of eyewitnesses? That first generation of eyewitnesses, the 500 plus that I talked to you about, Number one, they had no gain and a lot to lose from their testimony, okay, all of them. They had to abandon their occupations, their family lives. They left home and committed themselves to spreading the word. Jesus is God. He died on a cross. He rose again. The Great Commission. They all faced hardship persecution, suffered, and died because of their witness. And most of them uh, were executed after being tortured, but they did not change their statement. Why did they suffer? Why did they make that great sacrifice? Because they were all convinced beyond any shadow of doubt that they had seen the risen Lord.
What about witnesses beyond that first generation? That first generation is already passed away centuries ago. Let me just take you through a quick uh, view of history. Very quick, very brief. So we're going to talk about Rome. So Jesus uh, died and rose around 33 AD. Uh, around 50 AD, Paul wrote for us in 1 Corinthians the first creed of the faith. Okay, creed is a confession of faith. What do you believe in? And ro Paul wrote the shortest version and the most concise, but it summarized it all and what they preached those days. I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The scriptures he's mentioning here is the prophecies all before his death, okay? That it was a no surprise what happened to him. So that's around 50 AD, 1 Corinthians. At 313 AD, so between the, 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 res the resurrection until 313 AD, Christianity was illegal in the empire. Any Christian faced uh, persecution, prosecution, and death. And that's the golden age of the martyrs. When we read about all these martyrs, your crime was only that you are a follower of Christ. Crime punished by death. And this went on until 313 AD. When Emperor Constantine uh, granted Christianity legal status, meaning, okay, we're going to accept Christians as another religion. Okay, so Christianity is no longer uh, a crime punishable by law. He just made it legal added. And why did he do that? Constantine was not a Christian even at the time. He was just a good politician. He just realized that despite persecuting Christians for almost 300 years, they were just increasing in number. Why? Because of the martyrs. People who gave up their lives. They were not educated, they were not scholars, they only knew the creed that Paul wrote and I read for you uh, just seconds before. Jesus is Lord, he died on the cross for our sins, he rose again and he promised us eternal life if we follow him. That was the creed at the time. So 313, Constantine said Christianity is no longer illegal and ended up the, the persecution of the Christians. He just gave them freedom of worship. Okay. 325 AD was still under Constantine, and Constantine realized again, being a shrewd politician, that the, 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 the largest religious group in the entire Roman Empire was the Christians. And he just realized that if the church of those Christians remain united, he has the majority of the people in the empire to support him, and therefore the unity of the church was part of the unity of the empire, and therefore he was the one who called for the Nicene Creed when the, when the heresies at the time threatened the unity of the church. He wanted to keep the church united, so he called and ordered all the bishops and the patriarchs at the time you have to meet, you meet in Nicaea, and you're gonna have to resolve this, I want the church united. He's not a scholar, he's not a, uh, a teacher, he, he, he's just the emperor. I want the church united. So this is the Nicene Creed 325 AD. It gave us the Nicene Creed, the confession of faith. It was not until 380 AD when Emperor Theodosius uh, made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Okay, so he basically said the majority are Christians. That's the official religion. Okay, and he became a Christian himself. And then 381, uh, a year later, they completed the creed to the uh, version we have now 
Uh, that's in the Council of Constantinople when they added the last part of the creed about uh, the Holy Spirit. So we have the first generation witnesses, 500 plus, and uh, we have the generations of the martyrs. They did not see Jesus eye to eye, but they believed the original 500 witnesses, and they died because they believed those 500. Imagine a jury saying, it's not just one or two or three, this is 500 plus, I believe them. And they died for their belief, and now we're in the 21st century. And there are still those who believe what the creed tells us, what we know about Jesus, simply because I believe what my dad said to me, and my dad believed what my grandfather said to me, and my grandfather, and you can keep going backwards until you go to the original 500 eyewitnesses who had seen Jesus die on the cross and live again. You familiar with this picture? Who are those folks? This is our 21st century. These are 21 Egyptians who were uh, executed in Libya for refusing to deny that they believed that Jesus died on the cross and rose again and promised them eternal life if they were to follow him. 21. Now let's compare them and compare each one of us to Thomas. 21 centuries ago. Thomas said, unless I see with my own eyes and feel with my own hands, I'm not going to believe. Let me tell you, you are doing a better job than Thomas. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me with your own eyes and have felt me with your own hands, you have believed. There is a special blessing to those who have not seen with their own eyes and yet believe. That goes on past the first generation of witnesses all the way to us. <coughs> then who are we? We are the children of those eyewitnesses. Okay? That's who we are. We believe because we have not seen Jesus with our own eyes, felt him with our own hands, but we believe because we believe our parents and our grandparents and trace it all back to the first generation of witnesses. Okay. So what should I do? The, you know, Mansoor, you talk too much about history and witnessing and so forth. What should I do today, me, everyone sitting here in the 21st century? Number one, what Jesus commanded us all, the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay. You're going to ask me, Mansur, you're saying I should uh, abandon everything I have and go on a missionary trip? No. Only very few. I will tell you, Less than 1%, Jesus asked them, abandon everything you have and come and become a missionary and go and spread the word. That's less than 1%. What about the 99%? That's everyone sitting here in this hall now. See, Paul was one of those less than 1% who were called to leave everything and go serve the Great Commission. Paul starts almost every letter by this statement, I, Paul, a bond servant, and a bond servant is not just a servant, a bond, there is a bond on him, there is a deed on him, it's a slave. He, the slave has no choices to accept or reject the, 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 the mission. He has to obey or die. I'm a slave of Jesus Christ, called. I was called, I was ordered, I was given orders, and I have no choice here. To be an apostle, okay, leave everything and go preach. Separate it, separate yourself from everything. And all of you familiar with Paul, he never got married, he never had his own family, he never had his own life, he just served the mission. But that's Paul, that's not every one of us. 
Matthew wrote to us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Every one of you here is a light. God puts you wherever you are. Whether you're at a school, in a hospital, wherever you are, you're a light. And God puts you there and it's no chance. It's not an accident that you are where you are today. He put you there as a light to shine to those in darkness. And I tell you, there are very few lights in the world we're in and very few lights in the United States, but a little lamp can light up a huge, big space that is dark. You are this little light that will light and enlighten a huge, big place. And you don't need to be a scholar and you don't need to be very well outspoken. Let me read for you. Do not speak about the Lord Christ unless they ask you about him. But live as the Lord Christ lived so that they may ask you about him. You're different. You're a light to those in the darkness. Show them God's grace in your life and use words only if necessary. You don't need to give any sermon. Just let them watch you. And then they come to you and say, why are you different? Why aren't you like everybody else? That's exactly what God intended to make of you. You're different. You're a light. It's a calling. Wherever God placed you, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand, and it gives light to all of those who are in the house. You are that light. Don't let anybody put a shade on you. Every one of you is called to lead not to follow, so don't follow the crowd. You are to lead the crowd. You alone are gonna lead the crowd. You are called to lead the crowd, not to follow the crowd. To those who are young, do not submit to peer pressure. You should pressure them. You are their light, they are lost. You lead, you don't follow. But use discernment, as Matthew wrote for us. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. What is Matthew saying here? Math Matthew is saying that there are those who are in darkness who have already made up their mind, have rejected Christ. The conclusion bias that I talked to you about before, who have made up their mind before examining the facts, they refuse to see the light, they cover their eyes, cover their ears. They do not want to see the truth because the truth will mean you have to change and you're going to have to sacrifice. And they don't want to change and they do not want to sacrifice. They've already made up their mind. Don't waste your time and energy on them. Not only that, that they will try to hurt you, they will try to put a basket on you. But there are who, those who are truly lost in darkness and seeking the way, these are the ones you're going to talk to too. So use discernment. Be wise who you talk to. Do not give what is holy to dogs who have already made up their mind of rejecting Christ. Nothing is going to change them. And do not place or cast your pearls before swine. And Jesus warned us saying, I don't want you getting hurt with, with no reason. Don't go throw yourself in harm's way when you know the outcome. Behold, I send you as sheep in midst of wolves. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So who are we? We here in the church today. We're the children of those first generation eyewitnesses. So go and do likewise. And glory be to God forever. Amen.